A linguistic problem is rushing at us with each passing day. What are we going to call the decade after the decade of the 90s? The gay what's? The roaring when's? You can't blame the late Will Sapphire for trying. He wrote those words in a column in 1987. Who would have thought that there would still be no answer to his question even after the decade was over? The end of a decade, and the last time we cared about the end of a decade, and really in 20 years. Last decade's turn, we were much more concerned with the century and the millennium than the whole decade thing. It got kind of lost. Before I tackle some topics and look at the world, the last time we had a decade that was called the teens, let's ask this question. What would William Howard Taft, or for that matter, Thomas Jefferson, have called the decade that just passed, if they were alive. We know what Theodore Roosevelt or William Howard Taft, who was president in 1910, might have called it, the aughts. Not the aughties, as some want to call this decade past, and not the noughties, as others seem to be trying to call it with a wink and a nod. Aught is zero. And as Sapphire pointed out in his 1987 column, The word ought is from the Old English awit, A-W-H-I-T, meaning ever, that's the aw part, and wit, which is a creature or a thing. Anything in creation might be the translation. For ought I know might be the translation. Whatever might be a kind of modern translation of that ancient word ought. Ought and naught really come from the same base. Ought meant zilch. You know, you might say, we did all this work for ought. Since you said 1901, 2 you called the decade that resulted from all those years the aughts. And they did. And most likely, they did in the 1800s. I didn't see any evidence that they did, but I didn't search that hard either. But here we can dispatch with the aughty stuff. You say 1981, and they definitely said 1881. Thus, the decade, uh, the collection of those years, was most certainly called the 80s, if you were talking about that. The most familiar we are with the sound of the past uh, was the gay 90s, the 1890s, which, by the way, was a decade with one of the worst economic crises in American history, the Panic of 1893, depression, bread lines, companies folding and banks closing, people going to their banks and finding no money there. But things did get better in the later part of the 1890s, hence the descriptor, the gay 90s. But McKinley, Roosevelt, and Taft were saying 1901, 1902, etc. Thus, the collected description for the years that resulted would be the aughts, not the aughties. And likely the same for 1801, 1802, 1803, that decade too, the 18 aughts. But here we must enter the presence and trade the historical for the logical. We haven't said aughts all decade, even though people have suggested it. No one has really done it. Maybe a few friendless folks. We said O, oh, O1, O2, O3, etc. 2004 was 04. Because we were in a digital era, even before the internet, modern alarm clocks were showing digital numbers, a zero and then a one. Big zeros that were so prominent, we called them O's, 701. Not one past seven, as Thomas Jefferson would have said if he was that precise about time. So I see no reason why we should use an archaic formulation, even if so many people say we should, even if Bill Sapphire told us to do it. We didn't use it. We already named the decade. The decade is the O's. I know it sounds a little strange, but so do the aughts. And so does anything else we could come up with. The zeros? You can't say the 2000s, because the whole series of years that are going to have 2000 in it will be the 2000s. That's not good. You're going to get confused with the century. So you've got to say the O's. Now, having solved the problem of what to call the decade, I will next solve the social security problem.
Whether we call it the O's or the Roaring Winds, whether we call it the O's or the Zeros or the Roaring Winds, it's because of some importance, because now the decade goes to history. It's now past. Here I will point out, as Sapphire did in his 1987 column, and as many might email me after listening to this podcast, that Queen Victoria and William McKinley, president at the time, celebrated the beginning of the century in January 1st, 1901, not 1900, as we as a majority in the country changed in 2000. So that tells you that some of this is pliable. Time is, in a sense, created by historians. We get really philosophical about time. Now it's crunch time, though, because we will have to refer to this decade that's passed now that it's history. I mean, maybe we will have a couple of years before we have to say something about the O's, but eventually we will. Probably by 2012, we're going to want to get this name thing settled. Decades, though, are weak brackets for history. Is the 80s really the go-go 80s for our savings and loans owners, maybe, <laughs> for um, companies that made military equipment, perhaps? But 1981 and 1982 were fairly bad recessions. A lot of people out of work, same as now, same numbers as now, near 10%. 1987 featured a stock market crisis. The 70s really defy bracketry. Nixon was at the beginning, still in Vietnam. Ford was president in 75 in mid-decade. Vietnam was over, but there was Watergate and the toppling of a president. The 50s were not only the optimistic and youthful time, you know, featured in happy days. There was economic growth, but also war, recession, the crushing of a democratic movement in Hungary, a crisis in the Middle East, and a near conflict with our friends in Britain and France. But most of all, there was fear over the Soviet Union and the possible domination of the world and their elimination of our world capitals and cities. Some historians suggest that we should move things around when we consider decades here, making the 30s really to go from 1929 to, say, 1937 or 38, the 20s, say, from 1924 to 28, the 60s to include 1960 all the way to the end of Vietnam in 73. And some historians suggest the 20th century began with World War I, that that was the principal beginning event of the 20th century and defined what happened afterwards, including World War II. And it ended, as some historians suggest, with the fall of the Soviet Union. You'll hear things like, uh, this was the worst decade ever, say, you know, this decade of the O's, of course, and it it doesn't sound good on paper, beginning um, with an attack on the United States, a terrible tragedy in uh, New York City, in Virginia, in Pennsylvania, 9-11, along with a accompanying war and a uh, anti-terrorism effort throughout the world, a market depression, and a financial crash. But, you know, all decades do have their their problems. Uh, the gay 90s, as we mentioned, the 1890s, saw a severe depression, a popular movement of Grangers and Silverites, an unemployed army marching from the West Coast all the way to Washington, D.C., picking up people along the way, a Silverite candidate and a million-dollar business candidate, a war that would send U.S. troops farther than they had ever been before. The 1910s saw laws on primaries, Senate elections, child labor, women's suffrage, saw also race riots in America, violent labor strikes in America, and our doughboys fighting in France. Tens of thousands of them not to come home. It saw an epidemic flu and a paralyzed president. Depends how you look at any decade. But this decade we speak of, the teens, began with the year 1910, 100 years ago. And I suppose we could see how much has changed in 100 years. William Howard Taft was president, the first to throw a baseball uh, out in a, in a base, a professional baseball game. Aviation made strides in this year. The first flight from Albany to New York City. Seems small now. It was a big deal at the time. Then from New York City to Philadelphia, also in 1910. Across the English Channel. Big achievement in 1910. The first airplane to take off from a ship's deck. The first aviation conference held in Los Angeles. 
Germany launched its Zeppelin, and in Italy, a less inspiring event, the first crash between two airplanes in the sky. On the ground, the first electric bus was built and was serving Hollywood, California. The first motor speedway was built in L.A. Henry Ford made 10,000 cars in his factory. Patents for the first traffic light, first washing machine, and the fabric substitute rayon were all filed. Portugal and Mexico saw democratic revolutions. South Africa was formed, Japan seized Korea, and England got a new king. In art, the painter Kandinsky sought new forms, avoiding images of material things. Schoenberg created dissonant music. Early jazz emerged from ragtime in New Orleans and made its way around the country. Freud sought the inner self. In Reno, Nevada, the first black man to win the heavyweight championship of the world, an event that people looked at in awe and fear, Halley's Comet's tail zipped past the earth. 1910 might seem, uh, oh, uh, just a black and white image in our memories, but it was a real time that its inhabitants saw in color. Some listener questions. Brett Miller writes, Why is Cuba not a state? Bruce, the, the question I ask is not because I have imperialist leanings, nor do I think that might equals rights, and it was our manifest destiny. It just seems inconsistent when the U.S. did have an expansionist era where we were more imperialistic, when we annexed the U.S., Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Guam, Hawaii, Alaska, and all of the American West. Why was this large, lush, agriculturally prime piece of real estate that is now in retrospect very strategic to our security in this hemisphere never annexed? Uh, I would have thought this would have happened in the 18th or 19th centuries. I understand in the 20th century how it became a playground for the rich, powerful, and connected, and maybe politicians of the day might have wanted it to remain a getaway spot when they were pampered. Uh, Do you have any insights about this? Cuba and the United States. Uh, Long history of us coveting Cuba, or various parts, uh, various people in the United States coveting Cuba. There were several attempts on Cuba. During the Taylor administration, a group uh, tried to mount an attack on Cuba and help rebels there from a port on the east coast of Florida. Taylor had that shut down and uh, stopped that operation. During the Pierce administration, there were attempts, uh, again, to seize Cuba uh, or support uh, rebellions there. At the time, Cuba was considered as a slave state which would counter the new free state that was added of California in 1850. During the Grant administration, support broadened uh, to support insurgent rebels and hopefully uh, end slavery there. So now it was both Northerners and Southerners who were uh, behind an operation to perhaps help the Cubans fight the Spanish there. We also made an attempt at Santo Domingo, which was the Dominican Republic. Neither was completed during the Grant administration. The, for, and then finally, it was the Spanish-American War in 1898, which put us closest to acquiring Cuba as a U.S. possession. The cause of Cuban independence was, as it was for the previous attempts, uh, the, the reason ostensibly that the U.S. entered the war against Spain. Stories of the brave freedom fighters and the terrible Spaniards filled the country's newspapers owned by Hearst and Pulitzer. At the suggestion of Assistant Secretary of Navy Theodore Roosevelt, or at least that's what he told reporters, uh, our Navy was sent all the way around the world to strike a terrible blow against the Spanish Navy where they thought they were safe in the Philippine Islands to smash the Spanish fleet there. But when we won the war with Spain, we did not invite the Cuban freedom fighters to the peace table to help us negotiate. They were none too happy about that. Uh, We had kind of the setup to do something with Cuba. Obviously, we did annex Puerto Rico and other communities, including the Philippines. I would say that while the United States wasn't overly concerned with the Uh, point of how we would look, the public relations, uh, simply taking Cuba as a possession, it was probably some consideration. 
The only option would have been annexation and creating some type of commonwealth or territory in the way that we uh, ended up doing with Puerto Rico. If the question is, why was it entered in as a state? Why, was in, why didn't Cuba become a state in the, you know, in 1900, say, with full rights and with two senators? Uh, there probably would have been some opposition from Southerners to a new state with a Spanish-speaking population. We know that there was opposition to both Hawaii and Alaska, and that was started in the 1940s, and eventually they became states in 1859. But the question is a good one, uh, only you know, in, in terms of relating to our current politics with hindsight. Cuba has been quite a problem for us in the 20th century. Uh, hostile government on our shores since 59. If they were assimilated back then, things might be better, right? Well, it's possible. And you could make the case that either statehood or commonwealth status were conferred, we probably wouldn't be having a problem with Cuba on our borders. It probably wouldn't have been possible for a revolutionary to take over in a state. We would have acted very uh, boldly to stop that uh, versus a, a sovereign country. That's not to say some other nation wouldn't have just taken on that role that Cuba now took and that the revolutionaries, Che Guevara and Fidel Castro, etc., um, may have been active somewhere else. You bring up a good point. Statehood might have saved us. Hindsight's 2020, of course. At that time in 1900, I suspect that because we had fought the war for Cuban independence, there was already an established population there. We couldn't make them a state. It was only annexation. The Cubans that were living there wouldn't have liked that very much. We were facing a revolution in the Philippine Islands that was quite bloody. I don't think it looked good to completely take over Cuba and either from public relations or from a functional policy perspective. And so what happened is you had the Platt Amendment, with, which helped us to gain a lot of influence over the island, which we had up until 1959. And we created, of course, the base, the army base, Guantanamo Bay. Cameron Foster writes, Bruce, on your website you have a recommended reading list of books. I'm not sure when you last edited. In particular, I'm after more info on Aaron Burr. The little I know about him is fascinating in itself. And to think he was running for president. Well, thanks, Cameron. Aaron Burr, well, I think he is a useful figure for understanding history and politics and putting that old history in a contemporary perspective because he doesn't fit the role of a founding father, right? So the founding fathers are supposed to be great and noble people and not have these political aims. Well, they almost all did. Aaron Burr is just a little bit more blatantly so. So it's just a good example to have because he, although he was a younger fellow, he was operating at the same time as uh, Jefferson, Hamilton, etc. Hamilton was also a young fellow. As a result of his duel with Hamilton, which ended up, uh, in which he ended up killing Hamilton, and some other things, his conduct in the election of 1800 and his trial for treason. He's seen more blatantly political than other uh, than others of the early, you know, American politicians. He's born in Newark, New Jersey. Father was president of Princeton. His mother, father uh, was the preacher Jonathan Edwards. His Princeton class of 1972. He served in the Revolutionary War, achieving the rank of colonel. Uh, he served from 75 to 79. He was in Valley Forge. He was in the, served in the Battle of Monmouth. And he was a U.S. Senator from New York uh, between 1791 and 1797. He was also the creator of a political machine in New York City, an organization that would sponsor local, state, federal candidates. And it's a political organization that you can almost directly trace to Tammany Hall. Alexander Hamilton said about him as early as 1792, he is a friend to nothing but as it suits his interest and ambition. Burr was active in the New Republican Party and used his New York organization to help that cause. And thus, he was rewarded in 1796 with a slot running for vice president, with Thomas Jefferson at the head as the candidate for president. Jefferson of Virginia, Aaron Burr of New York, perfect geographic 
politics, right? Well, what happened in those days, as would become important, particularly in the next election, is you got a certain amount of elect- electoral votes, and the person who got the second most electoral votes became vice president. The one with the most electoral votes became president. It's not how it works now. President and vice president run on the same ticket. It's not how it worked then. It did work then that way because there were informally tickets and everyone was supposed to vote uh, that way. But politics is politics then as now. And members of the Virginia Republican group did not vote for Aaron Burr as their candidate for vice president. So Thomas Jefferson actually had quite a lot more votes than did Aaron Burr. Adams won the election of 1796. Jefferson became his vice president and immediately started running. In 1800, again, Burr's New York organization would prove to be so valuable that Thomas Jefferson again expressed the desire to have him as running mate vice president. This time, though, he made sure that these Virginia Republicans would not vote against him for vice president, that everybody would be on the same page. Jefferson's political loyalty to Burr on this point would not serve him well. When the 1800 election happened, no one defied Jefferson. All of the Republicans voted for Jefferson and for Burr. And that meant that there were 73 votes for Jefferson and 73 votes for Aaron Burr. So, the election went to the House of Representatives. This presented a problem because now it was the Federalist Party, the party that didn't like really either Burr or Jefferson, that would decide who would be the next president. They couldn't pick their guy, John Adams, or anyone else in the Federalist Party. No, the election was to be decided between these two candidates. Republicans were extremely annoyed at Burr. He should have immediately issued a statement, dropped out of the race. He did not. And in fact, he solicited votes from good friends that he had made among Federalists in New Jersey and Rhode Island and other states. A key Federalist and a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, Governor Morris, summed up the situation that the Federalists face as this. Both of them are void of character, but at least Burr has generosity or perhaps a lack of ingratitude. In other words, if we do this favor for him, we'll see something from Burr and we'll see nothing from Jefferson. And there were many Federalists coming to that conclusion. Jefferson was helped by an unlikely source. Alexander Hamilton, the creator of the Federalist Party, as it were, wrote back to Governor Morris, it would be a fatal mistake to select Burr. He knew Burr too well from New York politics. He used his influence to get his Federalist friends to vote for Jefferson. All of his faults intact. And Jefferson became president. And we think politics is crazy now. (laughs) I won't talk too much about the duel. There's so much uh, written about that, and you can, you know, read more about uh, Aaron Burr. I will talk about a story that, you know, maybe is not as well known in history about Aaron Burr, and that is his attempt at, quote, possible conspiracy in the West, and involves a future president. Andrew Jackson, then a young lawyer and -and up-and-coming politician in Nashville, Tennessee. In 1805, the former vice president of the United States came to visit Andrew Jackson in Nashville. This was a big deal. Jackson was an up-and-comer. Yes, Aaron Burr was no longer vice president, didn't have the blessing of Thomas Jefferson, and there was that whole dual thing. But this was the West of America, and Alexander Hamilton was not exactly the most popular person in the West anyway. So Aaron Burr was a very prestigious figure here, and his arrival was greeted with great enthusiasm. So, when a few months later, Burr came back to Andrew Jackson and said... I have uh, some plans to expel the Spanish from the Southwest. We had just acquired Louisiana, but Spain was still threatening our borders. This excited the opinion of those in the West who wanted more territory and wanted the Spanish out of any land in America. And Jackson, being careful, asked his friends. And the friends all supported it. It's the idea sounded great. Burr then asked Jackson for a list of names of people who would be helpful and he supplied it. And then he asked for 
a group of boats to be provided, and he provided Jackson with money to secure these boats. It was only then, when Jackson was talking to a friend who was a commander in the U.S. Army, that he had learned that there were rumors of a plot underway in the West, that someone was trying to take the Western states away from the United States. And it involved a man named James Wilkinson, who was commanding U.S. troops at New Orleans. Now Jackson was scared. But he didn't want to just go to Burr with these unsubstantiated charges. So Jackson wrote President Jefferson that he had been contacted by Burr and what what he had requested, and the governor of Tennessee. He also wrote Aaron Burr and said, I've heard about these rumors. What can you say? Burr writes back and says, I have absolute authority from President Jefferson to do what I'm doing. Just as Burr was able was was starting to recruit people and take these boats and sail to uh, ostensibly to Spanish lands, but perhaps just to New Orleans where he'd start a Western conspiracy, President Jefferson issued a proclamation that there was a rebellion in the West and ordered Aaron Burr to be captured. He was. Aaron Burr faced a treason trial. He did get out of the charges. But this event would haunt Andrew Jackson in his runs for president much, much later. Then much hay would be made of his role in this so-called conspiracy, particularly providing the list of men and providing the boats. So Aaron Burr got Andrew Jackson in trouble. Uh, Very interesting character. I don't have a great book recommendation. Most of uh, my information about Burr is from some other books, uh, which you'll find on the on the list, because he plays into the stories of so many other. Uh, one thing I'll throw out there is is try reading the uh, Gore Vidal novel Burr if you have not already. Yes, it's fiction, but he uses uh, historical sources. And the Gore Vidal is actually a distant relative of Burr, so there's a little bit of a favorable account. There's a little bit of he's trying to retell the family story, but that's okay. I think you get a good opinion of of both sides of the story reading that. More on the uh, Fox News and the mainstream media and objectivity talk. Uh, Sam said, Dear Bruce, thanks for another great show. You're right to emphasize, as you often have done, that politically sponsored news coverage is nothing new in American history. We have a long way to go before we reach the level of frothiness of the 1790s, much less the crazed 1850s and 1860s. That said, however, we should call a spade a spade and not try to equivocate or rationalize examples in our own time. My politics are moderate left, but I have many thoughtful and intelligent conservative friends who often tell me that they like Fox News specifically because it is so slanted to the right. They don't think Fox needs to apologize for this, but neither should anybody try to pretend otherwise. Obviously, Fox's own advertisers are aware of the bias. That's why you'll see an ad for Sarah Palin's book every 15 minutes, as well as hourly ads for conservative websites and magazines or investment fund ads done by famous right-wing personalities like G. Gordon Liddy or Ben Stein. Clearly, the people who advertise products geared to conservative customers know that advertising on Fox is money well spent. Fox's regular news broadcast is heavily populated by well-known Republican Party VIPs and activists like Karl Rove, often the sole political commentator on any number of issues, Ann Coulter, Michelle Malkin, and Ben Stein. Last week, I saw a panel halted, uh, hosted, hosted by Neil Cavado that comprised entirely of right-wing commentators who were debating whether Obama was a liar or simply incompetent. Fox is unabashed to conjure news stories of interest to a conservative viewership, such as their sponsorship and promotion of many of the Tea Parties this year. Fox advertised them for weeks in advance and devoted special day-long coverage to several of them, at which Fox News anchors were guest speakers. In years past, they've done things like busing school children to the Reagan Presidential Library to create and then cover a memorial service for that ex-president. When Fox does invite prominent Democrats to comment on issues, they often frame them differently. For example, last week a Democratic and Republican congressman were each interviewed regarding health care legislation. As the Republican spoke, only his name and party affiliation were shown on the screen. When the Democrats spoke, the Fox News alert red bar at the bottom showed things like, poll shows 56% of Americans oppose Democrat plan. In a famous example during the 2004 presidential campaign, an interview with Howard Dean was framed with a news alert reading, Dean soft on nuclear security. Upcoming news items are usually framed in slanted language, such as today's states fight back against health care excesses. 
It's disingenuous to pretend that one can separate the Fox News commentary shows like Glenn Beck, Bill O'Reilly, Sean Hannity, and Mike Huckabee from the rest of the program. Obviously, Fox pays these people a great deal of money and knows that their audience expects these programs. There is a reason that their shows are on Fox and not some other network. Finally, two very simple and telling examples. Fox News is the only network to refer to the Democratic Party as the Democrat Party, the name used by the Republicans. And of course, the most obvious example is that the very same Fox News commentators who have been vigorously criticizing Obama spent the previous eight years arguing that any criticism of a president during wartime was an un-American activity very close to treason. Perhaps the wars ended and I wasn't informed. Best regards, Sam. Okay, well, I wanted to air this because obviously we have, you can see the difference of opinion between uh, listeners to the podcast and about this uh, issue. Um, Take a couple of points. I'm generally in agreement that overall Fox is a conservative station, that they're probably more favorable to Republicans than Democrats. I think the survey data that they are a conservative station is, is overwhelming. Most Americans, most Fox viewers agree. You bring up the business angle, and it's probably true that someone trying to market a product to that audience would use that channel, and that's a pretty telling example right there. I went over some of the ratings data that this strategy is very helpful to Fox News as a corporation, and they're probably going to see growth uh, in during the Obama administration as people seek a different voice I am also in agreement on the point about separating opinion and news editorials. I think it's one channel. So just like you know, MSNBC has Keith Oberman and also has news coverage, it's kind of one jumble. Fox News has several prominent opinion makers. Most of their ratings come from that time period where these uh, opinion people are on. They've just you know, hired Sarah Palin for some, for some bits. So, you know, I think it's pretty obvious. And, and as you say there, you know, call a spade a spade. It's pretty obvious that Fox News is a more conservative station. And I go back to the talk about, you know, what originally started all this, which is the, does, was President Obama right to eh, at least point out, um, Fox News. They, then again, I, I also think that it was taken too far in terms of denying them pool coverage. You know, pretending they don't exist is not is not uh, going to work. So, kind of think more in the lines of what you're saying. It's conservative station. I might like to see it more labeled as such, but I I guess realistically, we're not going to expect them to go out and say Americans conservative station. I would just make a couple of points though in what you're saying. You're pointing out a lot of examples. Any of anyone who's coming to a news station with a particular point of view is going to look at what goes on on that station or what they read in a newspaper and react uh, to a certain way. If you like Obama, it's going to be hard to listen to a station where they're attacking. Obama, and especially if they're doing it, you know, fairly consistently. If you like democratic policies, say on health care, going to not like listening to a station where you don't feel you get a fairer argument. So is there some element of the bias that we bring into what we're reading? Sure. Is there some element of selective memory? We remember the good things that were done and not the bad things. We remember the time that they said something that was biased and we don't remember the time that they gave a balanced view on something. Sure. Still in all, it is what it is. And the other point, of course, that you'll get uh, criticized by someone who's a Fox News supporter is, well, you've done this analysis for Fox News, but where is your point-by-point analysis of, say, MSNBC, CNN, and what they've done uh, that might be considered supportive of Democrats or the Obama administration while watching it. Just on the Fox News, I think there are a couple of things that Fox News supporters that will point out that just need to be mentioned, that they have a balance in their audience of Democrats, uh, Republicans, and independents, while other stations, you know, will have more Democrats. They have Democrats and Republicans speaking in many segments. 
Uh, on the other hand there, I would say that some of the Democrats that they have, uh, you know, listed, say Alan Combs, or they would say Greta Van Susteren, for instance, is somebody more from a Democratic point of view, are not longtime advocates of Democratic positions, and they, they're not on Fox News advocating for what is wildly popular among the Democratic voting base. Fox News is doing its job, and so Obama is president, and you need a channel that is anti-administration right now. Fred Cole Jr. writes, Bruce, I want to take a moment to say that you shouldn't doubt your objectivity. It's a fine line you walk, and you walk it well. And as a person on the right, I appreciate how balanced your podcast is. Well, thanks, Fred. It's not that so much that I doubt my own objectivity. It's that I doubt all objectivity to a certain extent. Get a variety of viewpoints that solves that problem. I think one of the reasons this battle becomes so heated, but most people are concerned for others. Now, that sounds strange. It comes out of a concern for others. If we were only concerned about our own viewpoints, what's the big deal? Go get a variety of viewpoints. Don't just watch Fox News. Don't just watch MSNBC. Go read newspapers. Go listen to podcasts, etc. But we're actually concerned about those other people who we think might just be listening to one channel. And we certainly see how stories on just one media alone can propel into the other medias. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, the Obama administration originally was sort of taking on uh, Fox News. It's a debate that's out there. I've always tried to avoid the traditional blog debates. Is the media liberal? Is the media too conservative? Etc. Uh, you can go on and on forever. But it's a debate that's out there, so I think it's necessary to talk about, and it seemed necessary to do so with some preface on my own part about objectivity in general, in history, and my own objectivity. It's uh, Corey Schmitz right. I will second Fred from over here on the left. When Bruce ventures into modern domestic political issues, he occasionally makes me shout at my iPod, in a good way. When these topics come up from both the left and the right, they're going to be left unhappy. Just the price of doing business, I guess. Uh, On a related note, how about a podcast about uber uber partisanship in uh, American history? Democrat, Republican, Whig, Independent, etc. Certainly had all their shares of crazies who cared more about destroying their political enemies than governing. Okay, Uh, putting aside the image of somebody, uh, Corey, who is yelling at their iPod. And I've thought about a crust of the bread podcast where, you know, in American politics, you kind of have the sandwich and it seems like both sides sort of slice off the crust. The very extremes are just not going to get to make decisions. Yet by being there, they're influencing the moderates who end up making decisions. I mean, Olympia Snow and Ben Nelson basically deciding what the American healthcare system will be like. That's a strange combination. They're not people who have been fighting for health care for, for years or fighting against any of it for years. So it's, it's, it's the way things are, though. It's usually the moderates that end up and the crust of the bread gets cut off. One is they're the ratings leader. I talked about that a lot on the last podcast. Jeff65 writes, If you realize that there is a possibility other than corporatism, then you must acknowledge there are zero mainstream media outlets representing that point of view. In fact, there is an entire spectrum of possibilities other than corporatism. But you would never learn this from your schooling or hear it in the mainstream media. Self-identifying as left or right, liberal or conservative, only helps maintain the status quo because it frees people from the need to think and keeps them from coming together on individual issues in which labels aside that we'd otherwise agree. Okay, so a couple of points there, Jeff. I like your comment. I don't exactly know what corporatism is uh, exactly, but I, I suspect it is that corporations run the country and run our politics. Well, I would build that up a bit and then maybe shake the idea around a bit too. Let's start with the Democratic Party, because this is where the surprise will occur more, probably not with many, but more than, say, a Republican. Most people would expect that the Republican Party would be supported very well by corporations. Uh, Despite the recent label as socialists, uh, 
One thing to understand about the Democratic Party is that historically it was never created as the Labor Party of America. To to the extent American uh, politics had that, it was the socialists. They got a million votes in 1920 and petered out. So who became the Labor Party of America? An anti-civil rights, pro-Southern, free trade, pro-import, low-price coalition of politicians. The Democratic Party. A party that, sure, had the beginnings of Jefferson expanding the voting franchise and looking out for the small farmer and the small craftsman and artisan, and that jives. But it's also a party that in many American elections in the 19th century, at least one in the early 20th, they were the more conservative party on the ballot. So if you look at the 1868, the 1872 election, the 1892 election, the 1904 election, for instance. And if we define conservative as a party that wants to do less rather than more with government, they are clearly the more conservative party on the ballot. This is the Democratic Party. Woodrow Wilson changed that to an extent because he was a progressive Democrat. And FDR did too, and FDR, both of them, ended up embracing labor which was a helpful source of votes for the Democratic Party and gelled the Democratic Party and labor together to an extent. But the party was never a labor party completely, and it wasn't created that way. We see it now, or we see it in recent politics. In the 2000 election, for instance, Gore was backed. Here's just some of the companies that backed Al Gore. Ernst & Young, Citigroup, Viacom, Goldman Sachs, Time Warner, Bell South, Patton Boggs, which was a lobby firm that led the push for most favored nation status with China. This is on top of all the people working at corporations who, you know, while the donation didn't come directly from the company, worked for companies and came to fundraisers, millions of dollars. Just some of the many companies that would support George W. Bush in the 2000 campaign, J. Van Andel, the founder of uh, Amway, Kinetic Concepts, which is a medical device company. Donald Carter of Home Interior and Gifts, which is one of those companies that you sell products at house parties. Anheuser-Busch Corporation. So Democrats, backed by banking, finance, credit card, entertainment, of course law firms, who then work for companies all around the country. Republicans backed by multi-level marketing, oil, and beer. This goes to your point about corporatism. Corporations, in a sense, are running our politics. But let's just think a bit about what all that means. Money is all important in politics. In the old days, rich people got involved. I mean, it still took money to run. Washington, despite financial troubles, had acquired wealth from his wife's family, the Custis family. Jefferson as well was was from a wealthy family. Both had lavish parties in their early political careers. The merchant John Hancock supported the anti-British patriot efforts of Sam Adams and his crew in Boston. He was made president of the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, and from the moment independence was declared, he was one of the richest men in the new nation. But for Virginia ratifying the Constitution and thus having Washington in the mix, Hancock could have very well become president of the new United States. Still, so there are rich people and money involved. Still, I I take a step back from it all. Corporations and other constructions we might make, like the power elite or simply money in politics, they all have meaning, but then they get us away from meaning too. They dehumanize a process that involves real people doing real things. Corporations really don't do anything. You know, they're a paper with seals on them filed with the state of Delaware. But people do things. But people do things, and there are people running these uh, corporations. And corporations are also responsible for the employment of all but, say, 20% of us. So we have a capitalist system, though not without a significant element of government in the system. Corporations do terrible things. They pay people poor wages, unfair wages in some case. They make them work too many hours. They push products that are faulty. They bribe politicians to get a tax break. They go to other countries to avoid paying taxes in the U.S. They also provide jobs. 
They get us products we need lightning fast. They feed us. They clothe us. They give people skills. They promote people. Sometimes they pay their tuition. They do things that we might not be able to do, you know, just by all of us getting together. I'm speaking to you through a mechanism developed by a corporation, in a sense. The podcast wasn't, but an iPod or a Zoom that you're using was developed by a corporation. iTunes, which brings us together in extent, the index through which you found me, most likely, uh, there are other sources, was created by an evil giant corporation in Cupertino, California, the Apple Corporation, headed up by Steve Jobs which, by the way, was a company that was relatively Republican up until they supported Bill Clinton in 1992, to the extent the company got involved in politics at all. So what do you do? Can you really banish corporations from society? I'm not sure. They're here. But there are probably some other arrangements that can be made other than letting corporations do everything in society. You know, maybe we can find different ways to distribute uh, products. Uh, Maybe we can, you know, there are websites like, say, FreeCycle, where you put something out and somebody picks it up. Uh, And maybe it's the corporations who come in in the default uh, position. When nothing else is occurring, they're there. I do like your comment, Jeff. It has people thinking. And particularly the comment about self-identifying left or right. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Embracing terms such as left and right does to an extent mean some group is sort of controlling your thought. Uh, Now, I don't necessarily believe that that's a corporation. It could just be simply a group of politicians and activists. But what is left and what is right to an extent? Where do you put the guy who wants health care but also wants uh, people to be able to bear arms? Rather, embrace every issue separately, specifically on its own merits. And I would suggest all do the same. Otherwise, I think what you're doing is, you know, what we we should say for football, which is donning a t-shirt and saying, hey, I am a member of this group. John Rose writes, "Uh, Bruce, thanks for the on-air consideration. If I could expand um, more on what I meant by uh, business-friendly, I would like to clarify that to mean policies that put the interest of existing big business owners over the interest of the general population. Even policies that put existing companies out of business can mean greater job growth from the companies that spring up in their wake. And policies that punish existing business owners can strengthen the company in the long run by putting more competent ownership in control. In that vein, couldn't FDR be considered a man after my own heart? He favored unions over their employing companies, bailouts to farmers over the banks that held them in debt, direct government employment over tax breaks, encouraging private companies to hire, strict business regulation. And the way I see it, this isn't really a choice between pro-business and anti-business. It's a choice between the government encouraging economic growth through tax breaks, bribes, and deregulation, or by offering a better educated labor force, stronger infrastructure, and an unmatched spring of government-funded technological innovation. That's in a comment that uh, John had made earlier, uh, which I read on a different uh, podcast, uh, talking about the bipartisan conservatism. And there's a more extensive discussion on the Facebook site. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics uh, fans' uh, Facebook site, uh, where we're talking more about this under the heading of bi partisan conservatism. Just to respond to part of this, I would say, yeah, you make a good point. Government needs business. Business needs government. It's very unlikely that any private company would build a significant amount of roadways in America. No one company would have an interest to do it. They might have an interest in a small network of roads around the areas that they specifically need to bring their product to, but you know, uh, around their warehousing or et cetera, but uh, who's going to fund the public road? It has to be some kind of government entity. There's just no argument to be made for no government uh, whatsoever. Roads, infrastructure, then tend to create business. Government created the internet. That created a tremendous around, um, amount of business. There is an argument out there, which I am uh, friendly to, 
that healthcare is also another form of infrastructure. It's a thing, just like the sewer system, just like the roads, that nobody really wants to do, but it has to be taken care of. You can't have sick people. And because we tie it to employers now, it's wrapped up in uh, the business system. And that uh, unleashing that might create a whole nother round of business innovation and certainly labor force innovation as people are able to move from job to job, not worrying about, you know, who's going to pay for their health care if it was created, if it was thought of as infrastructure, just like you don't go around worrying who's going to pay for the roads you drive on. You go to your job and then your, you know, your employer would not be in the business of health care anymore. They'd just be hiring people based on their skills and merits and not worrying about either hiring them in the first place or they believe some concerned companies do worry about laying them off because of the health care. So it would, it would probably make labor more elastic, make the ability to go from job to job easier or work at a couple of jobs if that's what you want to do. Work from Monday to Thursday, take off Friday, your health care is taken care of. So that's a long uh, talk just about your last point about, you know, Government can do things to help business. And one point I wanted to make about the, the idea of uh, companies and tax breaks is I think if the ideologies were dropped, Steve Forbes, Ron Paulites, and progressives could all get together on one thing, drop the deductions, make businesses pay their taxes, and individuals pay their taxes. Everyone pays. It's no waivers, no deductions, easy to enforce, and easy to imagine that there could be wide cross-ideology support for it. We take it for granted, we don't even think about it, but in a sense, the IRS is one of the most progressive, redistributive agencies out there. They engage in a level of redistribution that William Jennings Bryan wasn't calling for. There are two vast middle-class deductions that we don't think much about. One is the deduction you take for children, And the other is for interest on the debt to buy houses. They help most of the middle class, though it could be argued they don't help childless renters. And it means that Americans don't pay their share of government. Now, I'm not saying they're not nice things to do. I'm not saying that they're not helpful to people. And they don't encourage uh, values that uh, we like to encourage in America. What I'm saying is, anything you deduct from your taxes cannot be used for all the expenses the government has, enhances adding to the deficit. So whether it's done by a corporation getting a tax break or whether it's done by a individual taking a deduction, those funds cannot be used. However, I think eliminating them would be harsh. And the only way to eliminate any deduction would be to eliminate all of them and just go with a flat Um, or just, I wouldn't want to argue for a flat tax. I would still like a progressive system based on your income, but a tax that there are no deductions from, and you just simply pay the tax you owe. We might be able to get with, get away with a little less tax, might be able to, to help the poor more with that. And we might be able to work our deficit out. Okay. Back in July of last year, Kristen McHale had uh, written in on our uh, Facebook site asking about the top two primary system of elections used in the state of Washington. Uh, Only the top two candidates in the primary get to go into the general election. So you can end up with two Democrats fighting each other, two conservatives fighting each other, two liberals fighting each other. Uh, And back in July, she had asked that she wasn't, you know, why this had occurred. Thanks for the response to the post. I still don't understand why elections are done the way they are in the state of Washington, but the recent Seattle mayoral race showed at least one benefit, possibly one detriment. The benefit is we didn't have to deal with the now, and I know I was counting the days till he was gone, ex-mayor being on the general ballot. The detriment, no one knew who the candidates were that did make it to the ballot during the general campaign. In fact, I can tell you I voted for the losing candidate. For the life of me, I do not remember his name. (laughs) Uh, One of the other things that Kristen had uh, written back in July was that uh, her dad was serving in Iraq uh, 
And she writes, lastly, in case anyone's wondering, yes, dad got back to Pennsylvania where he belongs safe and sound in December. Well, we're very glad to hear that, first of all. And secondly, yes, you live in the state of Washington, and it has a long history. It is one of the, quote, progressive Western states that has made attempts, not just today, but in the past, in its voting system. In 1910, 100 years ago, women were allowed to vote, finally, in the uh, state of Washington. It was nine years before the U.S. would allow that. So uh, it is a state that tries to tinker with voting in order to improve the results, hopefully for the better of the citizenry. I would express just what I expressed back in July in a podcast called Does Voting Make Us Happy? And that is simply that I'm skeptical about all changes in voting systems. People will figure out how to game the system eventually. And, uh, you know, you can develop some systems are better than others, but uh, you're always going to get some degree of gamesmanship and those who are creating the rules have a, always have some intention or some result that they would uh, like. Radical voting systems can have the result of exactly what you're saying. New faces can emerge. And it's just a matter of finding out because very often those new faces or young faces are backed by people who have been involved in politics for a long time. And if we take away labels... For instance, parties are bad, and people might say, well, Democrats and Republicans, they're the ones ruining the system, or et cetera, like that. If we t- Party labels provide one service to you, though, and it's exactly what you're talking about, Kristen, which is you didn't know who these people were. A party label at least provides some kind of a branding of who the person is and what they're going to vote for now. Of course, we've seen myriad examples in American political history where people defy their parties, but it still creates a kind of brand, a kind of experience that you'll expect from that person. And if they defy it, they do face the wrath of the party in either a primary or getting thrown out of a party or just being having party voters being angry at them. So there is a sort of enforcement that they stick to kind of a party line. We always see that as a bad thing. We like politicians who are independent. But on the other hand, total independence results in this, people who we don't have any idea who they are or what they stand for. And of course, if we take more time to educate educate ourselves, we can find out. But very often people voting in an election don't have that kind of time. They should, but they don't. So they use the party system, Democrat, Republican, to help them. I I do see the side effect uh, of what you're talking about. So much to talk about. I get so many comments on the website at myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com, the Facebook site, robust discussion there. You should go and check out some of the discussions. We, we brought up some economic issues, and I want to bring to your attention a podcast that I've been listening to and enjoying quite a bit, and that is the Econ Talk podcast. Econ Talk put out by Stanford University. It's going to be more of a conservative take on economics. But the gentleman doing the podcast will bring up all issues and look at things from all points of view and then um, get a range of opinions. And he talks to various authors. And particularly in this time where the economy is such a big issue, it's just a great podcast to listen to and and hear issues get discussed. Some of the talk they use is going to be economic lingo, but I think most of it you can figure out. So that's Econ Talk, and that's a great uh, podcast that I've been enjoying listening to. I want to thank you for listening to this program. The archive is available. It is still $9.99. I have not um, invoked the uh, right to raise the price. Appreciate those who have uh, supported it. The $9.99 gets you a subscription to the archive for one year, so you have access to one year. I thank uh, several people have come up for renewal now, and I uh, thank you very much. I've also instituted a email list, so those that join will be on the email list. I'm going to send you a little notes. There might be an additional note about the podcast. I sent out an email about the creation of the Lebanon and Mexico podcast. You're going to get some information that perhaps aren't available to others. There are good, oh, anywhere from five to ten hours of content that does not is not available to the general public is available to those who subscribe to the archive. The representation look at the 2008 election, what happened, um, and there's an examination of presidents and rhetoric. So good stuff of the archive. Thanks for listening.